Welcome to the only podcast for piano teachers just starting out, Piano Teacher Primer. My name is Angela Toon. Keep listening for the prime pro tips you can use with your own students right away. I want to welcome Amy Chaplin from the Piano Pantry podcast and Piano Pantry blog. Is that the name of your blog? That is. Yep. Hooray. I'm so happy to have you on here with me today. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. (laughs) This has been the funnest thing. One of the funnest things about getting into the online world and online business world is meeting these piano teachers from other states and hearing everybody's stories. It's so much fun. So I can't wait to learn from you and to hear your story. And we already love your cute voice and your podcast. (laughs) Thank you. So that's so funny. You mentioned my voice because I always feel like, you know, I I just can be very kind of bubbly, you know, and when I'm recording, I kind of have to like keep myself in check. (laughs) No way. Bubble away, girl. Bubble away. I love it. It's so fun. Well, thanks for having me. <laughs> Thank you. It's my pleasure. So I want to I wanna start at the very beginning. Tell me about how you got started teaching piano. And then I want to also hear about how you got started blogging and podcasting and all the things. Sure. Yeah, I'm excited to be on the podcast today. I just appreciate the invitation and um, hope your listeners, you know, find inspiration from our conversation today. Um, my story is kind of funny because back in the early days, I kind of bucked the idea of piano teaching. Um, not so much teaching itself, I would say, but the goal of being like a piano teacher as my career. So like a lot of people, I started lessons when I was seven and my teachers kept passing me on. My third piano teacher, who was my high school piano teacher, also taught at a university that had a, a piano pedagogy minor, which is very unusual for undergrad courses. Um, and so she wanted me to attend her university so I could do the, the minor in piano pedagogy. But at that time I was really big into like show choir at my school and I would teach, you know, parts during classes and stuff. And I was set that I was going to be doing choral ed. So music education, the summer after high school, I did teach a couple of students, uh, like out of my parents' house. But then I didn't really teach piano at all again until my summer after college, so after getting my choral ed degree. And at that point, my first teaching job was actually as a choir director at a middle school and high school. Oh, you're like show choir and all that kind of stuff, you know? (laughs) Very brave. That's quite a different animal than private. Yes, for sure. Wow. So, but at the time, I still took on a half dozen piano students and I would teach them one night a week, you know, out of our house just for a little extra money. After three years of that, I actually started the process of applying for a master's degree in just general music education. But kind of about that same time, my husband had an opportunity to take a job in Australia. (laughs) And we thought that that would be a great adventure. So off we went. It was for a two to four year stint. And kind of in that time, I knew I didn't want to do the choral ed thing again. I it was just one of those things, again, I did it in high school, but once I got into the career, I was like, yeah, this is not for me. Um, so it was kind of a break for me when we went to Australia to kind of figure out what do I want to do, right? I considered getting a degree at the University of Melbourne where we were living, but all they had was piano performance. And I knew I didn't want just a performance degree. That just wasn't my desire. And they didn't have just like a general ed degree. So my I decided to just kind of even have, well, they do now, but my college that I went to didn't even have a pedagogy degree. Okay. So wow. I did a performance degree because that's what there was. Because there is was. Degree. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so I just worked temp jobs, like in businesses and offices, which was kind of fun. And I, again, still kept teaching piano on the side. We bought a piano and I had, I think maybe a couple of nights a week, I had maybe eight to 10 students while we lived there. And at that time, like blogs were starting to become popular. This is like circa 2005 or whatever. Mm-hmm. And, um, uh, Natalie Weber's Music Matters blog was out there and Wendy Stevens Compose Create. So I was starting to read a lot of piano teacher blogs and teaching. And um, honestly, when we came back from Australia, I I still wasn't 100% sure what I wanted to do. And my husband had actually lost his job in the process because of the uh, like economic crash of 2008 and all the housing market stuff. And so we came home and I was like, I don't know if I'm going to have to just go back to teaching 
you know, to be like the primary income of what's going to happen. Well, when we returned, it was kind of fate because that master's degree that I had applied for before we left, they contacted me completely randomly when we came back and said, Hey, we have your application here, you know, you, about coming to Ball State for your master's. Are you still interested in that? And I was like, well, I don't know, you know, because of our situation. So I still went in and talked to the professor and she was the piano pedagogy person. And as I was talking to her, I was like, you know, I think I might be interested in something like this. And turns out they had an assistantship available for me to teach piano lessons. They kind of connected with an arts organization in our, my hometown to have somebody come and teach piano lessons to their community students. So it wasn't an assistantship like at the university, it was teaching piano lessons, you know, in a normal everyday community teaching situation. So it was just kind of fate. It was meant to be. Meant to <laughs> so be I got this the words that I was thinking of. Yes. That's yes. Amazing. I got this grad assistantship. And a couple of years later, I opened my studio, full-time studio, but while I was building it, I was able to keep that job. So that assistantship turned into a job with that community arts center for a couple of years while I was building my studio. Then once I had my full-time studio and it was in another town, so I wasn't like conflicting with them. Um, then I was able to let go of that job, but here we are 12 years later. <laughs> what a journey. I love yeah. it so much. And, and I bet you draw upon those different things working for businesses and choral, you yes. know, the different parts in teaching piano. Yeah. I can see that your past would help you draw upon those things in teaching piano. Yeah. I, everything that we do, I think just kind of, it does. It's interesting to see how, what you learn in different jobs and things can help what you do today, even if it's not always exactly related. Yeah. So amazing. Amazing. Okay. And you were blogging Let's see, you said you started, when did you start blogging? So, yeah, so I started my full-time studio in 2011. Okay. Then around 2015, about five years in, you know, I had really gotten my studio solid and I was kind of like, I just want to do something different. Like I was following a lot of other blogs and I had a lot of ideas. I'm kind of, I consider myself an entrepreneur, like an idea person. And I was toying with the idea of my own blog and talked to a friend, Joy Morin, who also has a blog and she encouraged me. You could, she's like, you can do it. You've got great ideas. So I did. So in 2016, I started the piano pantry blog and a few, I don't know, two or three years later, I opened a shop on piano pantry with a few products. And then trying to think, um, maybe back in, well, what else do I have? Um, <laughs> Oh, I started consulting last year. So I opened up like individual consulting services. Oh, and then awesome. I started also, consulting also piano sorry? consulting piano teachers. Yeah. It's just more kind of like one-off consultations. Sometimes, you know, it's nice to just have somebody to throw ideas around with or to say, Hey, to kind of help me work through this one little thing. Not so much ongoing coaching where you're checking in with each other continuously with multiple sessions. Not that I want to do multiple sessions, but it's just kind of a, a single opportunity. Yep. Yes. So whether it's, you know, business related stuff or teaching or whatever. Oh, that's so I started awesome. that. And yep. then, and then cast. Yes. Within the last couple of years, I really wanted to do it like back clear in 2018, like for forever. I wanted to do this podcast but life was just too busy. Like my husband and I were building our house, which is what my studio is in now. And it just was not the right time. So <laughs> I was a little bit late to the game with all these other podcasts that finally started coming out. But yeah, January of last year, be January, 2022, I started the Piano Pantry podcast and it's a weekly podcast that drops every Tuesday morning. It's And so it's about a 15 minute podcast. Thank you. I try to keep it short and, you know, to the point. And, um, yeah, it's just a solo podcast, but then I do teacher talks every five episodes, which just kind of changes it up. And then this year I started introducing some guest hosts, which has been kind of fun as well. So, so fun. Yeah. It's a, it's a lot of different things, but it's like, it's so fun. You can just pick what you want. And I, I love it. I love your, I love your podcast. So of course Thank I you. <laughs> Well, this is such a fun journey to hear what you're doing. Oh, and I think I saw on Instagram, you do some retreats too. Oh yeah, that's that too. <laughs> so the, a lot of these things have started within the last couple of years. So the podcast, the consulting and the retreat I started last year as well. And 
that is a in-person three-day getaway at my home in Northeast Indiana. And it's very small. Like I only accept three to four teachers per retreat because it is like individual coaching. Like I'm there, small group. It is, um, it's actually focused on digital organization. So the goal is kind of twofold. One, that we have some one-on-one time with other teachers to just kind of chill out, to relax, to, you know, talk, to get rejuvenated. And also some time to actually sit down and clean up our digital workspace, which is not something we often give ourselves time to do. And I actually coach teachers through an, an eight session process during the retreat. So um, we, we work through things like email cleanup. We work on how to organize all of our files, um, how to capture content online and things that we follow that we want to use later and how to save it in a way that's useful that we will actually go back to it and not just let it, you know, end up in a big pile of things to read later. Um, yeah. So I, we walk kind of systematically through this process and build up from the little things to the, the big things. And the nice thing is we're just sitting there together at a table, working through it together, cleaning things up in a relaxed state, even though we're also working. So, and because I like to cook, I also cook for the attendees. So I prepare breakfast and lunch and then dinners out or on their own. So I love really your- fun. I loved your post about the crock pot. Yes, we piano teachers are queens of the crock pot. Absolutely. I was just last night and I was like, oh my gosh, I'm teaching for four hours and this smells amazing. I cannot wait to eat. <laughs> or your students come in, they're like, it smells good in here. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Do you do one of my students was like, is that chili? It smells like chili. And I'm like, you're pretty close. It was chicken enchilada soup. <laughs> good guess. Good guess. Do you do instant pot? You know, I have one and I don't use it that much. Like, I don't know. (laughs) I use my Instant Pot all the time. Yeah. I keep trying to put it away and it just keeps coming back out. (laughs) The nice thing about that as opposed to a Crock-Pot is it's a little bit quicker. So you can do it at the end of the day after teaching, you know, where Mm Crock-Pot, you have to do it much earlier in the day to get it prepared. So, Or like soups, I can brown in the Instant Pot because it has the saute and then I can slow cook in it. So yeah, it's, so it's all right in one low cooker. Yeah. So I, I love my pot. big fan, big fan over here. <laughs> Move into uh, your three top tips, prime pro tips for beginning piano teachers. We all started out once. You, of course, had a master's degree, but we all started out one time. So so first one, go for it. Yes, but I did not start with a master's degree, right? Oh, that's true. <laughs> I started right out of high school, which is how a lot of us, I think, start. So my first tip is to just have grace with yourself. So our profession is a lot different than a lot of others in that there's like no rules or regulations or requirements for being allowed to teach, which is kind of good in a way because it gives us opportunity. Um you know, we started the same way we started because we can play, right? Either you needed a way to make money in high school, like I did, because you don't want to go to a factory or someone just asks you to start teaching their kid because you know how to play the piano and they're, you're the only person they know that plays the piano, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of us start teaching, not because we know how to teach piano, but because we know how to play piano. And, and that's okay, right? It's it's a starting place. And the best way to learn, I think, is just jumping in, right? And figuring it out as you go. And it's it's hard because being on the other side of the bench is like a whole nother experience, mm-hmm. right? Than being the person on the bench. Mm-hmm. Right? So like being taught and now here all of a sudden you're like on the spot. So it's okay to feel unsure of what you're doing. It's like, you don't really know any different anyway, right? You just have to jump in and get your feet wet. And luckily we have methods that can help us with that, right? It's a great place to start. Use something that you're comfortable with. And again, a lot of people teach the way that they were taught because you don't know any different. And that's just, it's just, it's a place to start. I actually have, I actually have an intermediate student of my own, um, who, who has a family friend that contacted her last fall and was like, Hey, will you teach our seven-year-old daughter piano lessons? And without even consulting me, she just grabbed her first book that I used with her and started teaching piano at a, I think it was piano safari one, (laughs) you know, 
Sure. So yeah. That's awesome. Be okay with not always knowing the answers. It's okay. <laughs> yes. Oh, so good. And and I love how your three build on each other. So let's hear the second one. Yeah. So the other one is while it's good, um, I think to, to start with like one method and focus on one method. Um, and actually Julie Nur, who's one of the co-writers of Piano Safari, which I mentioned earlier, I remember her writing a blog post a while back about while we want to grow as piano teachers, sometimes it's nice to just get solidly comfortable with one particular method series and just really do it well. Right. And I think that's really good advice for beginners to, to stick with one thing, really learn how to do it. But eventually that's, that's just good advice for beginners. I think eventually we need to like open ourselves up. Right. And be curious, like, don't just take everything for what it says to be like, learn how to teach using that method, but ask yourself, okay, why do they teach it this way? Like be curious and willing to grow and learn. How could I do it different? Right. Maybe the method book teaches no reading, starting with base C and treble G like Piano Safari does because they want to teach intervals and have a space note and a line note to start from. But is that the only way to teach note reading? Like what's another way? Like maybe, you know, I would enjoy teaching base F and treble G in middle C first because it shows the relationship to the staff and the mirror image of the piano. Like learn about different ways of approaching teaching certain concepts and be willing to grow. Um, yeah, and maybe even write down observations, like make little notes about things that you notice your student, your students doing well with or maybe not doing well with and take it from there. Because every method has pros and cons. It's kind of like buying a house. Maybe you, yes. you built your home, so maybe your home is just exactly perfect. But there's always give and take, right? And there's pros and cons. And knowing those pros and cons, and then you can pick a certain method per, for a particular student. And, yes. that needs. And, and I find that when I'm just getting kind of stale or kind of bored of the pieces or kind of checking out mentally because I've heard this pieces over and over and over. And I'm like, maybe I need to try something new. Something else. And I, I agree with that. Be willing to grow and learn yourself. Oh, and then the third one is kind of how to do that. Yes. So the third one is to build a support network. Find a piano teacher buddy. So maybe it's another new teacher in the area, even that you get together once a month and you bounce ideas off of each other. Or maybe you reach out to your teacher and say, hey, you know, if maybe if you're not connected to them, maybe it's one of your older teachers, it's been a few years, say, hey, I'm starting to teach. Do you have any advice? You know, can I pick your brain? You know, would I be able to meet with you months, once a month? Anything like just find someone that you can, you know, reach out to when you have a question and that you trust, right? That you would trust their advice and their opinions. Um Maybe it's even like starting to get involved in like online forums, right? So Facebook has tons of piano teacher forums. Now I caution you a little bit in this area if you're a very new piano teacher, because there's so much advice out there. I don't know how much you're on them at all, Angela, but Facebook groups can get a little crazy <laughs> and everybody has opinions, but what you have to do is just kind of learn to filter you know, go in with questions that you have and, you know, you start kind of learning to trust certain people that, you know, give opinions and um, just use your own best judgment, but you don't have to do this on your own, right? Even if you only have three students, I think it's important for us to just to have somebody that we can trust, that we can go to for advice and that we don't have to feel totally lost and like, you know, like we're figuring it all out all by ourselves. Oh, that is so, so good. Yeah, I haven't been on the Facebook groups much. Um, I've mostly done the the MTNA groups and Federation of Music Club and then and then Instagram, you know, making friends on Instagram has been super Instagram's great. <laughs> it has really exploded in the last few years. It's so fun to see different people's ideas and and then how you can save things in there now. It's almost yep. like a Pinterest board in Instagram. Yeah. I can go to that to get, to get other ideas. And, and for beginning teachers, like how you said, it's easy to get overwhelmed 
Mm -hmm. Or when I had young kids and was teaching, I was like, oh, I just don't have the bandwidth for some of these big grand ideas. And so I would kind of just do one new thing a year. Yeah. I would think about it through the summer and kind of in September, I would implement one, maybe small thing, maybe try a new method, maybe uh, try some occasional group classes, maybe. And one year I started the Federation of yeah. music clubs and exactly one new thing. I mean, like my little like high school student who's 16 teaching her first student, you know, I would not like throw five different method books at her or anything, you know, it's like go with one thing for a while you know, and focus on that. Um, and I think as far as support networks go, that it depends on where you're from. Like some cities may not have a teacher's association. Mm -hmm. So maybe for you, it's just finding another local teacher in an individual, mm -hmm. or, you know, maybe you have a thriving association and you're not a one-on-one -on -one person. So maybe you don't really want a one-on-one mentor, but you're happy to be a part of this big local group. So I think a lot of that just is going to depend on what you have. Like, I don't have Federation in my area. Well, it, it's like an hour away. I think there's places you can oh. do it, but it's not anywhere close, you know? No. Yeah, so. that would make a lot of sense. And then and then what you said about finding a new teacher to buddy up with. I love that yeah. idea. When I was in college, I just had a couple students. So the recital was like 20 minutes, two families. Okay, we're done. Like, it's kind of funny. So I got one of my friends and we did a recital together. And she was also just starting teaching. So that made it really nice. fun and a bigger the nice thing about that is like, it's not so much a, a student mentor relationship as just a colleague relationship and that you're in the same place in life, kind of you're experiencing the same things and it's just a different type of mentoring experience, I think. So, yeah. Oh, so, so good. Well, if people want to read your blog. Just Google Piano Pantry blog. I'll put a yeah, link. Piano, uh, pianopantry.com. Yep. Yeah. And then on the pianopantry.com, you can find the blog. You can find my shop. You can find information on the retreat, on consultations with me, any of my speaking sessions. Like I do a lot of like um, state, local, and national association presentations. If your group you know, brings people in, I do that as well. And that is all housed on pianopantry.com. So Fantastic. And then in, on Instagram, you are uh, at Amy Chaplin Piano on Instagram and then Amy Piano Chaplin, Pantry on yeah. Facebook. Yep. Yes. Like I know I follow you, but I like him. And Chaplin, it's like Charlie Chaplin, not a, a minister chaplain. So it's not C H A P L A I N. It's one A, one I. C H A P L I N. More like what it sounds like. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, Amy, what a delight. I love hearing everyone's stories and I love how everyone is so different, but I love how we're all like helping these teachers to just build up the piano teaching world together and uh, music teaching in general. So thank you for being with me. I so appreciate it. You're welcome. And thank you for all you're doing for be beginning piano teachers. I love that your podcast is specifically focused on new teachers. So <laughs> I got overwhelmed too. So this way it's like only what you need to start out is my idea. Yep. I love it. Thanks, Amy. Have a Thanks good so one. so much for having me. Yep. Thanks for joining me on this episode. Teaching piano has given me a fun and fulfilling way to add to my family income. With over 20 years of experience, I've put together my best advice into the Piano Teacher Primer course. It gives the motivation to start teaching and the confidence to keep going. We can multiply the joy of music and multiply income at the same time. Visit AngelaToon.com and together we'll change the world one student at a time.